The Demons Have Taken Over. That was the title of a blog post made by Joseph Edward Duncan just two days before he brutally murdered Brenda Groen, her boyfriend Mark McKenzie, her 13-year-old son Slade, and kidnapped 8-year-old Shasta and 9-year-old Dylan, who he also killed a few weeks later. The Fifth Nail blog serves as a rare, unfiltered, and horrifying dive into the mind of a truly depraved individual. Let's investigate. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can become a Ko-fi member or a channel member to gain access to uncut videos and other perks, or you can leave me a tip by clicking the thanks under this video. Thanks to anyone who considers this. This video will contain discussions on child SA, murder, and other topics that might be triggering to some. View discretion is advised. You can become a Ko-fi member or a channel member to watch an uncut version of this video which features extra details that were unsuitable for this cut. If you enjoy my videos on internet mysteries, you'll absolutely love the game that's sponsoring this video, Conundrum 929. Conundrum 929 is a captivating internet mystery game inspired by real internet mysteries such as Cicada 3301. The game starts out with a perplexing post on Reading, which has a similar format to Reddit, with a cipher that needs decoding. I won't spoil the rest of the plot, but there are currently 12 different mysteries, ranging from ciphers to finding hidden messages to geographical puzzles. I really like how Conundrum 929 feels like you're investigating a real internet mystery. You almost forget it's a game at times. It's engaging yet chill, you can solve the codes and puzzles in your own time, so it's the perfect way to unwind after a long day. There are four difficulty levels, from Total Beginner to Seasoned Riddle Solver. The harder the difficulty, the less hints will be available to you, so whether you're an expert detective or an amateur sleuth, there's a level to suit you. I've been totally hooked on this game, and I'm sure you will be too, but don't just take my word for it. You can check out Conundrum 929 on Steam in Early Access for just 5 euros, a great price for such a creative and fascinating game. Click the link in the description and start investigating today. I'm not entirely sure when the fifth nail blog was started, as later posts suggest that there are some missing towards the beginning, but the first post available now is from January 2004. The second post by Joseph Duncan, or Joe as he calls himself on the blog, started out relatively uneventful, and he explained that his landlords came over to replace light bulbs and return the snowblower they borrowed. He then mentions someone called Captain Mims going back to prison, before having a bit of a rant about the parole system, quote, I can tell you from first-hand experience that the entire probation and parole system is a farce. People are sent back to prison while on parole for non-criminal offences that get counted as recidivism to drive up the numbers so it looks like almost everyone who gets out goes back. The truth is, if you read the statistics carefully, you will notice that the highest recidivism occurs within the first two to three years after release. Do you think it is a coincidence that this is also the average probation period? I was arrested and sent back to prison as I got very close to successfully completing my parole in 1996. The charge was possession of a firearm. What happened was my brother brought his gun, which he is legally licensed to carry concealed, to my apartment without my knowledge or consent. He laid it on my computer desk while playing a game on the computer and I picked it up by mistake while it was still in its holster, not knowing what it was. As soon as I realised what it was, I told him to get rid of it, so he left. At my next parole interview polygraph, the examiner asked if I had touched any guns. Remembering the incident, I said yes and told him exactly what happened. Several weeks later, after reading the report from the polygraph examination, the parole board ordered my parole officer to have me arrested for possession of a firearm. 
I lost a good job and my residence as a result of the arrest, though no criminal charges were ever filed. These types of violations are very common and directly attribute to such high recidivism rates, reported frequently by the media. In the next post, titled, I Know What I Know, Joe explained that he realised that his blog is really for him, hence he insists on painstakingly making entry after entry, knowing no one will ever read it. He says it's important because it's his connection to who he is and who he is becoming, a way to connect to who he was so he can understand who he will become. This would imply that what Joe eventually did become, a murderer and a kidnapper, was very different to whatever he was before, or what he is now. Having no prior knowledge of his actions before reading this blog, you'd be forgiven for thinking that he hadn't done anything very wrong, at least not murderously wrong, prior to his first post. He did state he was on probation, though he conveniently leaves out what he did. The next post is titled, Life is in the Details, and is a very detailed account of what Joe did that day, 29th of January, from 5.30am when he wakes up for work, to 12.28pm after he returns home from work and eats scrambled eggs and fried ham for lunch. The events of that day aren't really important, I think what's more noteworthy is Joe's thoughts surrounding them, presented like an internal monologue. There is something to be said for his motivations behind making a post like this in the first place. For all he says he knows no one will ever read his blog, it certainly seems like he wants them to. Perhaps part of him wants the attention, but I think a large part of it is that he wants to be understood. The way he meticulously explains his every action in this post as if he wants readers to feel like they are experiencing it too. Maybe he thinks that will help them to understand his crimes when they're revealed, even encourage them to have more empathy for him. At 12.20, shortly after he returned home, Joe wrote, Put cup of water in microwave and set it to four minutes to boil so I can take it outside and watch it turn to steam when I throw it in the air. Minus 24 degrees out does that. I can sure be childish at times, but I think everyone should be sometimes. I'll always remember what it was like to be a child and a prisoner. While I did study psychology for a couple of years, I'm not a psychologist, so take all my analyses in this video with a pinch of salt, and feel free to add your own interpretations in the comments, but I believe this line is quite significant. I'll always remember what it was like to be a child and a prisoner. Of course it implies that he misses being a child when he was free, and contrastingly hated the lack of freedom when he was a prisoner, but it could also be read as that he was a child and a prisoner at the same time when he was younger. This might make more sense as the blog dives deeper into Joe's past. Another interesting point is regarding what he says about his cats. Cats are being good. Rusty got up onto the counter, but got back down when I told him to without me having to yell, so I gave him a treat. He looked at me like he deserved something more, but ate it anyway. Gave Copper a treat too. I usually reward both my cats, even if only one did something good. That prevents animosity, I think, or the other one from thinking he is being punished when he's not. Well, that's half a day at least. Gotta go. Rusty is demanding I pet him right now. Forget the blog. In a later post, he also says, I feel that animals should have rights, and violating them for our mere convenience is disgusting. I don't even like calling my cats pets. Most people who know me know that I prefer to refer to them as my boys. Again, this will make more sense as we learn more about his past, but I wonder if he treats his cats in a way that he wishes he was treated when he was younger. More to the point, it's interesting to see he clearly has some level of empathy and compassion for animals, yet this doesn't always seem to extend to humans. I guess it would make a bit more sense if he became some kind of vigilante criminal, only targeting people who he thought deserved it. It's not that uncommon for people to have even more empathy when children and animals have been harmed, but Joe literally kidnapped and murdered children, who never could have done anything to deserve it, yet he gives both cats treats when one does something good so the other doesn't feel like he's being punished. Joe's next post was in response to an article with the headline, 
Texas judge requires S offender warning. Quote. That is a headline I found on the internet just now. Some states require XSOs to have special license tags. This whole registration thing is getting more and more like Nazi Germany all the time. If someone were to propose a law like Megan's law back in the 1940s, that person would have been spat upon as a Nazi sympathiser. No sooner do our World War II veterans pass from this world than we start passing laws and adopting social agendas that they fought to protect us from. I guess we're too busy supporting the new warriors to remember the old. If you saw my video on the S Offender support subreddit a couple of weeks ago, you might think this sounds very similar to some of the posts on there. I don't think it's accurate to imply that World War II veterans were fighting to protect SOs from being on a register, and the comparison between those who advocate for that and Nazis is honestly laughable. Anyway, this certainly seems to give a hint at what Joe could be on probation for. I don't think someone who isn't personally affected by laws targeted at SOs would be so angry about them. The next post confirms this. While I was in prison, I educated myself and made serious efforts to understand how my life had gotten so far off track so quickly. Now I'm a professional software engineer, but have a hard time finding work or even a place to live because of all the hype surrounding SOs. I can't even find a girlfriend because the kind of woman I like, mature and educated, are terrified when they find out I'm a level 3 SO. Which of course I am not, I'm an ex-convict, and that is all. People must realise that it is never okay to discriminate against any class of people for any reason, even if that class is so obviously offensive. Discrimination is always based on the perceived offensiveness of a class. Blacks were portrayed as a threat to decent society, as were the Jews in Nazi Germany. The truth is that most SOs do not re-offend. For more information, please visit The Fifth Nail. It is a fledgling attempt to voice an injustice, not against SOs, but against the unsuspecting people of this country. I discovered Talk Left while I was searching for information about the effects of registration laws on crimes. I've been searching on and off for months. I've found nothing yet. A lot of hollow claims, but no data. I suspect crimes are up, especially the violent stranger type. I could never guess why. What would ever make a person behave so angrily toward another completely innocent person? Could it be that that innocent person somehow represents society and the violation is some kind of attempt to regain control? I'm no psychologist, but I do know ignorance never solved anything. Again, this is very similar to one of the posts I covered in my SO support subreddit video. This one had compared the treatment of SOs to that of the LGBT community in the past. It's honestly just a ridiculous comparison, whether it be with the LGBT community or black or Jewish people, none of whom did anything wrong to deserve what was done to them. Contrastingly, SOs are literally facing the consequences of their own actions. Whether they assaulted someone or looked at CP, they have caused harm to other people. There are no similarities between SOs and any marginalised groups that have been unfairly oppressed and discriminated against. In a later post, Joe says, If you think that SOs have little control over their behaviour, then that is the TV thinking for you and it is nonsense. This makes his comparison even less valid. If SOs have total control over their behaviour and they still choose to assault someone, that's significantly worse than if they couldn't help it. He does go on to say that after doing more research into the discrimination against Jewish people in Nazi Germany, he realises that the so-called discrimination of SOs is not on the same level, and therefore he now describes it against SOs as watered down in comparison, which I suppose is an improvement, but still a ridiculous statement that ignores the fact that being an SO is a conscious choice involving harm towards others. Anyway, seeing as Joe failed to delve into the specifics of what he did to become an SO, allow me the displeasure of informing you. His first recorded crime of this nature was in 1978 when he was 15 years old, which involved him SAing a 9-year-old boy at gunpoint. 
Joe later claimed that it was a BB gun and not a real gun. Nonetheless, I'm sure the victim thought it was real, so the effect is still the same. The next year, he was arrested for driving a stolen car, sentenced as a juvenile and sent to the Jesse Dislin Boys Ranch for no more than a year. I'm not sure exactly how long, but he was out and committing more crimes in 1980. While at the ranch, he apparently told his therapist that he had essayed around 13 younger boys by the time he was 16. When he was released from the ranch, he stole his neighbour's guns and used them to threaten a 14-year-old boy who he also essayed. This time, he was sentenced as an adult and given 20 years in prison, but he was released on parole in 1994 after 14 years. After this, he moved around frequently in the Seattle area before being arrested again for marijuana use in 1996. Weeks later, he was released on parole with new restrictions, but he violated these and ended up in prison again in 1997, where he stayed for three years until he was released due to good behaviour in July 2000. And that brings us up to the time he started his blog, where after violently essaying multiple children, he acts as if he's being treated unfairly because of the restrictions he's brought on himself. On the 22nd of January 2004, Joe made a post titled, Ramblings about reality and truth and free will. Here's a quote. One of the most enlightening experiences I ever had was years ago when I was at the McNeil Island State Penitentiary. I was doing a lot of soul searching and in the process I moved into a two-man cell with a known child molester that nobody else was willing to live with. This guy represented everything I hated. He was a rat snitch, self-righteous, pious Catholic fraud, not to mention child mal who admitted to his perverted love for little girls in a sickeningly sheepish way. This guy was worse than the most despicable character you ever saw on TV. They can't make characters in a movie this sickening because nobody would ever want to watch. What bothered me the most was how far out of touch with reality this guy was. If you said anything to him, even if you tried to compliment him for something, which would be a task to find something to compliment about him, but I tried, he would automatically assume you were attacking him, and your words were the words of the devil himself, and he would look at you just like that. But one day in the chow hall, when I walked in, I noticed that he was the last person in line I was heading toward, so I instinctively started heading for a different line to avoid having to stand behind him, or being seen near him. But then, I caught myself. I hated him. And at this point in my life, I was just starting to understand that hate is a fool's resource for dealing with fear and ignorance. So I continued to the line he was in, fighting off the demons that would have me put him down the whole way. By doing this, I won a battle inside myself, and for the first time I could see that he and I were kin. I'm not saying that I am anything like him, or that we are equal. I'm saying I saw for the first time that we are all the same. Not separate and similar, but together and the same. It is a complex concept when viewed from eyes focused in this world, but when you let go of the illusion that typically passes for reality and see the underlying truth, it all suddenly makes sense. There is only one will, one God, only one. Joe goes on to debate the existence of free will, basically concluding that we don't have free will as most people see it, but rather that we are limited by God's will, as we are all made by, defined by, and limited by God. So if you hate a p-file, you are hating God, that sets your limits and defines you, so you are also hating yourself. Anyway, the way that Joe viewed that p-file he shared a cell with in prison makes it glaringly apparent that he either doesn't understand the gravity of his own actions, or at least pretends not to. He hated that this guy admitted his love for little girls in a sickeningly sheepish way, yet Joe's first crime was essaying a nine-year-old boy when he was 15. Okay, he wasn't an adult at the time, so technically wasn't a paedophile himself, but there's clearly a reason he picked a younger boy rather than an older adult. How can he not draw parallels between his cellmate and his own actions? Is it because his cellmate openly admitted to his crimes, whereas Joe clearly prefers to downplay and minimise? 
I don't know if Joe genuinely didn't see himself on a similar level to his cellmate, or if he chose to act like they were so different on his blog to give readers the impression that his crimes were nowhere near as bad. The interesting thing about this blog is that he was creating the narrative, so he could paint himself in whatever light he chose. His readers knew nothing about him beyond what he chose to share. It's not like they were in the position we are years later, looking back on this with the knowledge of what he did and how it all ended. In a post titled Zombies, we get to learn a bit more about Joe's time in prison and his thoughts surrounding it. Here are a few excerpts. My prison experience is almost impossible to describe to someone who has never been in one, especially back in the 1980s when prison violence was at an all-time high. I was just a kid and despite my crime, pretty naive, I saw people getting stabbed, hanged, raped, you name it. I, of course, was attacked more than once while I was in prison. The state even documented the likelihood that I would be because of my age and appearance, yet nothing was done to stop it from happening. And because I refused to rat on my attackers, I was left in the main population so it could happen again. I learned how to survive by fighting back, and I've been fighting back ever since. Out here, in the real world, I have worked hard to fit in despite having little social reference. It's not easy trying to act normal when you quite literally grew up in a prison. Prison culture is totally different than anything out here. Some people say that a person tends to forget prison after they've been out for a year or two. Not me. I can't forget. Even though most who meet me are shocked when they learnt that I spent half my life in prison because I seem so normal, it is an integral part of who I am. I just don't let it show. I don't hang out with other ex-cons, so I really have no one to talk to who would understand what I was telling them, but that's okay. I have this blog now, and it is already helping me feel like I can finally talk about what I went through. Another reason I don't talk about it is because I'm afraid someone might think that I'm looking for sympathy. That is the last thing I want. I treasure the time I spent in prison, and I treasure the pain and loneliness as a valuable memory, and I'm very glad that it is just a memory. While it was the worst experience I ever had, it is beyond my ability to express. I don't cry about it because tears seem so quaint, though I still feel hurt and talk about it when I can. Crying seems so pointless. I now see day-to-day -day hurts as little treasures, but like anything of value in this world, they are treasures that were never meant to be kept. I let my hurts go on their own accord, and the hurt from my past is one I have already let go, just not forgotten. How can I see pain as a treasure? Simple. There was a time when I came dangerously close to losing the ability to feel anything at all, and feeling something now, even pain, is better than feeling nothing. So when I feel good, even if it's just a little good, well, that is just pure magic. So if you want to feel sorry for someone, then feel sorry for all the people in this world who have given up on ever feeling anything, the zombies. A few days later, Joe mentions his crimes, or crime, again, as he talks about what he's done as if there was only one single incident. He describes it as, a terrible act committed by a confused young person who did not realise at the time the impact of his actions. He states that he has taken full responsibility and acknowledged the heinous nature of his crimes, which obviously isn't the case, or he wouldn't have committed more crimes after that. This is another example of him minimising and downplaying his past, knowing he can control the narrative as no one really knew who he was at that time. By this time, he was known to have SA'd two different boys at gunpoint, and admitted to SAing many more when talking to his therapist, yet he says his crime rather than crimes. A few posts later, Joe wrote, I just discovered that my pet mouse has died. This makes me feel a little sad. I rue the day that one of my cats die. I have always been a very sensitive person. I suppose that is why I have an especially hard time with people thinking I would intentionally hurt another person. It's not that it bothers me because I know I wouldn't. It bothers me to know that they think I would. In fact, it hurts. 
but I have learned to deal with my sensitive feelings by trusting that no matter how hurt I feel, it is okay because God has everything under control and feeling hurt is just a part of his plan. And so I try to embrace the pain and then let it go and never hang on to it. So now it is time to let my little mouse go. Obviously we know that Joe did go on to harm more people, but this pose makes me question his mindset at the time. Was he, again, trying to make himself look better than he was to anyone reading? Or did he, at least for some time, genuinely convince himself that he had changed and wouldn't harm anyone else? Knowing what we know he did before this, I don't think it would be possible for him to change. Statistically, he was right when he said that most SOs actually don't reoffend. Personally, I wonder how true this is considering such crimes have a very low conviction rate, so chances are if someone did reoffend, they'd get away with it anyway and so wouldn't contribute to the statistic. But let's for argument's sake say that most SOs only commit one crime. I guess you could have read the blog at the time and considered it a possibility that Joe truly had changed, that he had seen the error of his ways, dealt with the consequences of his actions and reformed. If you believe an SO can be rehabilitated, then I suppose Joe is relatively convincing in the way he talks about his past and how he seems to have some level of empathy now, especially if you're led to believe he only broke the law once. I wonder if the empathy and emotion in his post now are all just a facade though. We really don't know what's going on in his head or his true motivations for creating the blog in the first place. He certainly seems to be on some kind of mission to end the so-called discrimination against SOs, so maybe he thinks by portraying himself as a reformed individual who made a terrible mistake but is now compassionate and wouldn't harm a fly, that will help his case. The next few posts are mostly just general life updates, basically public diary entries. For all Joe complains about the discrimination against SOs, he seems to have a surprisingly decent life, considering. He has a good job, he's still in contact with his family, he has friends, such as his neighbour who he speaks to frequently. He talks about going skiing with his colleagues and meets up with other people too. He does talk about being lonely on more than one occasion and he doesn't have a partner, but he's hardly been outcast from society in the way that he implies SOs in general are. For all we know, he could be embellishing parts of his life. At least part of his motivation for blogging in the first place seems to be escapism, but making his life seem more exciting than it is wouldn't exactly fit his narrative that the lives of SOs are comparable to Jewish people in Nazi Germany, albeit in a watered down sense, as he says. The next noteworthy entry was titled, Justice or Just Us, You Decide. Here are a few excerpts. I've researched a lot on the topic of SOs, why they do what they do, but more importantly, what it is that they do. The problem with trying to treat an SO is very similar to trying to treat a drug addict. You can tell a drug addict how bad drugs are for them until you are blue in the face, and even if the addict tries to believe what you tell them, there will always be that little rational voice in the back of their head that says, yeah, but nobody was really hurt, or they're not really that bad. Well, most of us know of course that simply isn't true. The drug user is just rationalising their own behaviour. So the mistakes therapists commonly make is instead of digging into the source of that voice, which is in fact a rational voice, bear with me I'll explain, we instead berate the offender with how wrong and even monstrous their thinking is without giving them credit for having an honest rational thought. That of course merely results in walls going up and progress, if any, being faked. I learned that most people who prey on children have discovered that adult child sexual relations are not in and of itself a bad thing, and does not in and of itself cause harm to the child, assuming no physical injury has been inflicted. You may scoff at this, saying of course they think that, that is what makes them sick, but by scoffing, you are only perpetuating the problem by rejecting a rationale that is based on solid fact. Let me clear a few things up before I go further. I'm not a paedophile, nor have I ever been accused of being one. Also, I was a child, age 16, when I committed my crime. And possibly most significant, because of my appearance and family circumstances, I was molested 
so often and by so many different people that up until the time of my offence, I actually thought it was normal and that everybody did it. You cannot help a dishonest person by being dishonest. Society must learn to face the truth if it expects the offenders to face the truth. We must face our own sickness before we can expect offenders to face theirs. We must learn to recognise and work within the social context of crime. In addition to Joe's questionable commentary on SA and how to treat SOs, he reveals one important piece of information. He was SA'd himself many times as a child, which honestly explains a lot. It's worth noting that Joe's brother apparently denied that this ever happened, implying Joe was lying, which for all I know might be the case, but I'm not sure how his brother would know for sure. If Joe was essayed by family members, that doesn't necessarily mean his brother was too, and unless his brother was with him every second of every day, it'd be impossible for him to know definitively whether he was lying or not. Anyway, for the purpose of the analysis, let's assume Joe was telling the truth. He says it happened so often and by so many people that he thought it was normal. Considering he claims to have been rehabilitated, we can probably assume that he now logically knows it isn't normal, but does he really know that on a deep level? I was questioning before this whether he actually does feel empathy or compassion for others, and I wonder now if he does, just not in the same way that most of us do. He doesn't torture his cats because he knows it would cause them to suffer, and he doesn't want them to suffer because he cares about them. He clearly has empathy for his cats, so why doesn't this extend to the children he essayed? The effects of SA are very complex and vary from person to person. An incident of that nature tends to cause harm to most people that experience it, but they don't always realise in what ways it has. Sometimes it's not until they receive therapy that things start clicking. Joe could have been in a minority of people who weren't consciously affected by the SA they experienced, or he at least thinks it didn't affect him or cause any harm. In which case, when he essays someone else, he's a lot less likely to feel empathy for that person because the same thing didn't harm him, so he doesn't think it will harm them either. It also seems to me that he struggles to understand psychological harm, as he implies he knows that SA is harmful to children when physical injury has been inflicted, but he's claimed that adult-child relations are not in and of itself a bad thing, suggests he isn't taking into account the harm done by exposing a child to something they're not emotionally mature enough for, as well as the effect of being taken advantage of and pressured into something of that nature that they haven't and can't consent to. Through rehabilitation, he may have been told that his actions were wrong and that they did cause harm, and he might be able to logically understand that to be true, but if he can't relate to the harm on an emotional level because he wasn't harmed by the same actions and he thinks it's normal, perhaps he can still, in his mind, claim to be a good person because, in his mind, he did nothing wrong. Over the next couple of months, Joe updated the blog less frequently than he did in January, and there isn't really much worth mentioning. Mostly just his day-to-day -day activities, as well as a few comments on the treatment of SOs, nothing that he hadn't said before. He explained that he had been busy with moving, but stated he should prioritise making daily entries because it's a valuable check for his day-to-day -day activities, when the day comes that he is accused of some crime he didn't do. He said he had already been a suspect in at least a few and directly accused of at least one, where a woman claimed he had harassed her, even though he claimed it was in an area of town he had never been to. This led to police showing up at his door to tell him they were watching him. On the 6th of April 2004, there was a post titled, Thinking for yourself, no you're not, it read, Today, after my STAT 368 class, I walked past a young college-aged man in a wheelchair. His legs were spasming and he stopped rolling so he could grab his legs to try to stop them from acting up. He ended up leaning over and hugging both his legs desperately to try to make the spasms go away. I'd seen many handicapped people before and have always respected their plight, but this time it struck me different. I felt guilty for speaking out against being wronged by society when this young man had been wronged by life itself. For a moment, I seriously considered abandoning this blog and the fifth nail message and doing something to help people like him. 
But instead, I thought there is not much I can do for him. His struggle is his and mine is mine. While I will take my struggle over his any day, I can only consider myself fortunate that I'm just labelled an SO instead of physically handicapped. I'll take the label any day. But that does not mean I accept being labelled. It is just that I recognise that there are far worse fates. I guess I'm just realising that my struggle has a context and I must keep that in mind when trying to get others to listen to me. And again, it's not the label that bothers me as much as the fact that the process of labelling SOs is causing more and more innocent people to get SA'd and even killed. When I think about that, I get angry again and feel my message is not a personal one. It is for everyone. That is why I have often referred to us when speaking about society. Labelling SOs doesn't hurt the SOs anywhere near as much as it hurts their victims, because it does nothing to deter the problem, it only further supports it. We must see this. We must see that as a society we are supporting a cesspool that is breeding violent criminal behaviour. The SOs are just acting out what they have learnt from us. I know, because when I was 16 I was acting out what I had learned, nothing more. I was, and am, very fortunate to recognise this. And as I've mentioned in this blog, I have lived as intimately as you never want to other extremely dangerous criminals. I have seen in them what they themselves did not see, that they are products of society. It's an old song, but a true and desperate one, I think intentionally drowned out by certain organisations that use the system for profit and power. This almost felt like a bit of a turning point for Joe, an opportunity for him to realise that he isn't discriminated against in the way that he has convinced himself he is. He realises that whatever consequences he is facing are nowhere near as difficult as being physically disabled can be, and yet it still doesn't click that the only reason Joe is facing consequences is because of the crimes he chose to commit, whereas someone who is disabled did nothing wrong to deserve their disability. He makes the point that when he was 16, he was just acting out what he had learned, and I suppose there is something to be said for him being a product of his environment, but for him to truly change as a person, he'd need to fully accept the consequences. He can explain it with reference to what happened to him when he was younger. I guess he can also get to a point of forgiving himself if that behaviour was all he ever knew and he didn't realise how wrong it was, but if he uses that to justify what he did or minimise his actions, he can't be totally reformed. He can never change what he did, he can understand what led him to do it, but complaining about the punishment when he punished an innocent boy who has to face far worse consequences than the legal consequences he has to face will only hinder any progress he ever could have made. Throughout the rest of April and May, Joe was updating the blog even less frequently. Any posts he did make were not particularly relevant or at least provided no new information or insight that hadn't been present in previous posts until the 6th of June 2004 when he talks about how he has decided to give up on trying to convince people that he has honest and good intentions and that he isn't a monster. A post the next day reveals that that night he had been hearing a strange noise coming from what he described as a long rope-like apparition suspended in mid-air. Quote, when strange things like this happen to me, even if I am half asleep, it reminds me that I cannot trust my own mind. Maybe I did see a ghost of sorts that night, and maybe I was possessed when I woke this morning. One can never really know, reality is relative. We don't know if this is the first time recently that Joe hallucinated in some way, but it's certainly his first mention of it. And if so, this could suggest his mental health is deteriorating. These two posts do seem to mark a change. From here, Joe seems to lose touch with reality a little more. Not that he had a huge grip on it in the first place in many ways. He also seems to have less patience for life's events in general. The following month, he made a post titled Sociopaths Rock. It read, A co-worker yesterday inadvertently accused me of not caring. He did it just as I was leaving to attend a class, so I was thinking about it on the way and came to some startling realisations. Maybe I don't care as I should about how people feel. 
Usually, when I've been accused of not caring in the past, I quickly dismiss the accusation because I know in my heart that I genuinely and deeply care about many people and things. My cats fall under people. But what I hadn't realised before is that my habit of easily dismissing another person's feelings as not important is the reason why people think I don't care. But the reason I disregard people's feelings is because I think for the most part they are superficial. For example, if someone I care about says something I think is wrong, rather than agreeing with them or even not saying anything to spare their feelings, I would likely speak up and say I think it is wrong. My view is that if they are offended by my honesty, then they need to grow up a little. But if I protect their feelings instead of expressing my view, then I am ultimately hurting more than just their feelings. I'm denying them the truth. I think this is a major problem with our society. At the same time, I have to realise that this is the world I live in, and if no one else sees things my way, then I must take it into account. Not necessarily changing my view, just adapting my behaviour a bit to accommodate others' views. What is really interesting about this whole way of looking at things is that a psychologist might call me sociopathic because I'm rationalising the fact that I am insensitive to how others feel. Hmm, maybe we need more sociopaths then. This sure is an interesting take about feelings being superficial, considering many of Joe's posts centre around his feelings being hurt because he is discriminated against because he's an SO. The day after, on the 3rd of July, he updated with a very short entry. I had a very explicit dream last night. I dreamed that I was scuba diving and ran out of air, but I could still breathe. I just didn't know for how long. I was going to dive today and actually started to, but when I got to the lake, I turned around and came back. I just hoped the dream was for today. On the surface, this may seem like an insignificant post, but remember what Joe said in the past about blogging his daily activities so he could recap in case he was ever falsely accused of a crime? Well, in hindsight, it seems that he was actually trying to give himself an alibi, as he was later convicted of a crime that occurred on this very day. He had essayed two boys at a playground in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Eerily, just a few days later, he actually referenced the incident, stating he got a call from an investigator in a city around an hour away from where he lived. Quote, Apparently I'm a suspect for some undefined incident that occurred last Sunday. He would not tell me anything about what happened, though he did not seem too concerned, except to say it was a felony and all felonies are serious. In other words, it was probably not too serious at least. Perhaps more eerily, a couple of weeks later, he made a post stating that children are more likely to be struck by lightning or bitten by a shark than abducted by a stranger, then implying that kids should not be taught not to talk to strangers as it keeps them from learning new things and thinking for themselves. Here's a quote from an entry a few days after that. I don't like the police, and I don't much care if they don't like me, which judging by sneers and snide comments I have received from the police in the past, they certainly don't like me. They live in a world where right and wrong are absolutes, which any thinking person realises of course is ridiculous. I believe there is right and wrong, but I realise intimately that these are relative to my perceptions of reality, which as I just mentioned in an earlier blog entry, is almost totally in my head. So, I don't expect others to see the same things as right and wrong as I do, but I will defend what I think is right to my own death. But I would never expect someone else to fight for my belief. It is all belief. I believe intentionally hurting another person is wrong, and if I see you hurting another person, and that person asks, directly or indirectly, for help, in other words, they also think what you are doing is wrong, then I will step in. But if that other person indicates they do not want my help, then I will not impose my belief on them. Though I might tell them what I think. The issue of adults hurting children is a tricky one, but clear in my mind, though difficult for me to express without sounding callous. While I am very compassionate, only recognising the true consequences of imposing my beliefs on other people is more harmfully than any harm one person could ever inflict on another. 
I have long believed and have often expressed, nothing you, one person, can do to me will make me anywhere near as angry as what the system has already done and is doing to society and everyone in it this very moment. This excerpt highlights the inconsistency between Joe's online persona and his true self in real life, that or the detachment between his views and his actions. His view of what is right or wrong might differ to others, but he himself believes that intentionally hurting another person is wrong, yet that didn't stop him from essaying those two boys after he had supposedly reformed, and still he insists on more than one occasion that he isn't a paedophile. It's impossible to say whether Joe is just delusional and has convinced himself that he isn't causing harm with his crimes, or if the person he portrays himself as on this blog is the person he wants to be and yet at times he slips up and just can't stop himself from being the person that he thinks society sees him as, while swearing blind he isn't that person. The entries over the next few months were mostly philosophical analyses of responsibility in the justice system, similar to various other posts we've covered already, still highlighting that Joe would rather blame society for his actions than take accountability himself. It's interesting to read through these posts because at times he makes some valid points. Most people, SOs and other criminals included, are products of their environments and upbringings. Many SOs have been SA'd themselves when they were younger, many criminals haven't had good upbringings or they've lived in poverty or around drugs. Fix all the problems with society and theoretically crime could become almost non-existent. But that doesn't mean that individuals, Joe included, shouldn't be responsible for their own actions. There are many people who have been SA'd who don't go on to become SOs themselves. There are plenty of people who have grown up in poverty or around drugs who haven't turned to crime as adults, despite the disadvantages they face through no fault of their own. Most people have had at least one really bad thing happen in their lives that they could use to justify committing crime, but if we all did that, the world would be an even worse place than it is now. Flash forward to April 2005, the month before Joe kidnapped two children and murdered one of them as well as another child and two adults. We can see at this point that a storm is brewing. Quote, Sir, I've been accused of murdering a little boy. Those close to me know I didn't do it of course, how could I? I'm not even a paedophile. Well, I'm not a psychopath either. I feel the full force and pain of everyone I have ever hurt, but that doesn't stop me from doing what I need to do. Ultimately, my feelings don't matter. I learned that in prison. I have to carry out my orders, or a lot worse than just me dying could happen. Nine days later, there was another update. Yes, I am still alive. I honestly wish not. I just don't know how to kill myself so it makes sense. Nothing makes sense to me right now. Last night I realised I was scared and alone. Being scared doesn't bother me as much as being alone, but it is a fact that I probably chose sometime before I was ever born because I've been making the decision to fight my battles alone since I was a small child. The current battle is of epic proportions. I do not make this claim idly either. It is a battle between me and my demons. Only two people in the world have a clue as to the power and nature of my demons beside me, and they will probably never read this. But just the same, these demons are stronger than even I gave them credit for, and now they are taking my best blows and not even staggering. I'm afraid, very afraid. If they win, then a lot of people will be badly hurt, and they've had their way before, so I know what they can do. I've been praying a lot and asking God for help. I've asked him to step in and intercede directly because I see no other way at this point that I can win. If you are reading this and you believe in God, please pray for God to help me defeat my demons. God has shown me the right choice, but my demons have tied me to a spit and the fire has already been lit. I don't know if the right choice is even an option anymore. It's worth noting that in March, the month prior, Joe had been charged with the SA of those boys in the playground the year before. A businessman who Joe had become acquaintances with helped him to post bail, which had been set at $15,000, but he skipped bail and disappeared. 
It seems that he knew at this point his time was running out, the jig was up, and so he might as well go out with a bang. And that brings us to the demons have taken over. Thanks for the comments. As far as letting God take care of the demons, too late. They've locked up their Happy Joe person in the same dungeon that Happy Joe kept them in for so many years. Now they are loose and I'm very afraid. From now on I may refer to Happy Joe as Jet, me, and the demons as the Bogeyman. If you are familiar with me or even my fifth nail website then you will understand the names. I've been asking God to help defeat the demons. In fact, last night I was on my knees begging him, crying out loud to him, to help me. He didn't answer, again. The problem is I am losing my religion. I don't accept anything at face value, not even my own thoughts, so when I start having religious convictions I question the source. And in my current situation, I figure I am under a lot of stress and there are perfectly natural human mechanisms that account for all religious experiences. The demons, if that's what they slash it are slash is, I use the term for mere convenience, have convinced me that I should at least question my religious beliefs. This makes sense, otherwise I would believe anything, and that is how they got the key to the dungeon and trapped me inside. To be more specific, I am scared, alone and confused, and my reaction is to strike out towards the perceived source of my misery, society. My intent is to harm society as much as I can, then die. As for the happy Joe, Jet, well he was just a dream. The bogeyman was alive and happy long before happy Joe. I was in prison for over 18 years, since the age of 17. As an adult, all I knew was the oppression of incarceration. All those years I dreamed of getting out, and getting even. Instead, I got out and I got even, but did not get caught. So I got even again, and again did not get caught. So, I figured, well, I got even twice, actually more, but that's here nor there. Even if I'm the only one who knows, so now what? Well that was when their Happy Joe dream started. I met a bunch of really good people, the kind of people I didn't even know existed, but here they were, bunches of them, my neighbours, my landlords, my professors, my co-workers, and they were all good people, who were willing to give me a chance despite my past. They were willing to accept me and be my friend, something that was new for me, having been betrayed by many friends and even my own family. So I tried to make it work, but the problem was those demons, the ones who got even for me. They kept reminding me that if my new friends knew about them, and what they, I, had done to even, then so much for their friendship. So, Happy Joe was just dreaming, or pretending to be happy. This post more or less answers any questions we had regarding the difference in Joe's online persona and who he really was. It was all a facade, and he knew it. He knew what he was doing when he essayed those boys, he knew he'd probably do it again. He knew that he hadn't really reformed, but he desperately tried to stop anyone else finding out. He created that Happy Joe persona, the idealised version of himself that he could be in front of his friends and on his blog, but he knew deep down that he would never be this version of himself. He could pretend for a while, but one day, the monster that was his true self would inevitably escape. Joe's final entry was two days later, on the 13th of May 2005. My blog entries lately are erratic and full of a lot of BS, for that I apologise. I'm just trying to put down what is in my head regardless. As far as taking people with me, well, I don't know if that is right or wrong. In fact, I don't know much anymore what right and wrong even is. My view is either everything is right in some regard, or everything is wrong in some other regard. The question, one I am struggling with at this point is, does it matter? Does anything matter? My mother is crying right now because her son is in trouble again. She tried to raise a good son, and she knows her son has a good heart, so why does he do these things? She's probably more hurt and confused than me. Does it matter? It hurts me to know these things, but does it matter? A hundred years from now, all my mother's pain will be forgotten, and other mothers will cry for their sons. A million years from now, there probably won't be any mothers, at least not like we know. 
I have feelings. In fact, I think I must be more sensitive than most people because I seem to feel more than they do, at least more than what they openly express. I feel for the starving children and families in the world. Others say, oh, that's too bad, but I can't do anything, so... I wish I could be more honest about my feelings, but those demons made sure I'd never be able to do that. I might not know if it matters, but just in case, I'm working on an encrypted journal that is hundreds of times more frank than this blog could ever be. That's why I keep it encrypted. I figure in 30 years or more, we will have the technology to easily crack the encryption, currently very uncrackable PGP, and then the world will know who I really was and what I really did and what I really thought. Also, maybe then they will understand that despite my actions, I'm not a bad person. I just have a disease contracted from society, and it hurts a lot. I hope to complete this journal before I die, soon, or turn myself in. I still might do that. I think it is the right thing, but of course I'm not sure. Speak of being sure, I wish I could be sure about my thoughts. But right now, the only thing I'm sure about is that I'm sure about nothing. It is not a good position to be in, considering my circumstances, being a felony fugitive and all. Three days later, Joe had gained clarity and reached a decision, one that would solidify the death of Happy Joe and would have unimaginably tragic consequences for an innocent family. On the 16th of May, police discovered the bodies of 40-year-old Brenda Groen, her 37-year-old boyfriend Mark McKenzie, and her 13-year-old son Slade in their home in Idaho. Their cause of death was determined to be blunt trauma to the head, making it clear that they had been murdered. The more imminent concern, however, was that Brenda's other children, 9-year-old Dylan and 8-year-old Shasta, were missing, presumably kidnapped by the murderer. Though no one wanted to make the presumption, it seemed incredibly unlikely that either child would be found alive. However, on the 2nd of July, Shasta was seen at a Denny's restaurant in the city she lived, accompanied by an unknown man. Employees of the restaurant recognised Shasta from news reports and knew the man she was with was likely the man who had murdered her family. They called the police, who arrived shortly after and arrested the man, who of course turned out to be Joseph Duncan. It was a miracle that Shasta had been found alive, but her brother hadn't been so lucky. His remains were found at a remote makeshift campsite two days later. Joe claimed that Dylan's death was an accident, but Shasta disputed this, stating that Joe attempted to shoot him in the head with a shotgun, but it failed to fire, so he reloaded the gun and pulled the trigger, killing Dylan instantly. Shasta told the police that immediately after, Joe started crying and told her that he only killed Dylan to put him out of his misery. A few days later, Joe had decided to kill Shasta too and gave her the choice of being shot or strangled. She chose strangulation and while he was doing it, she begged him to stop and called him Jet, the nickname he had mentioned in the blog, and he stopped immediately. He asked if she would like to meet his mother and she agreed. It was on the way to his mother's home that they stopped at Denny's and Shasta was rescued. It shouldn't be too surprising to learn that after his arrest, Joe was found to be responsible for other child murders too. Shasta revealed that he had admitted to murdering 11-year-old Sammy Joe White and her 9-year-old half-sister, Carmen Cubius, in July 1996. Joe later confessed this to investigators. 10-year-old Anthony Michael Martinez was kidnapped at Knife Point on the 4th of April 1997 and his decomposing body was found two weeks later after being essayed and murdered. Joe resembled the composite sketch of the perpetrator and a partial fingerprint that had been taken from Anthony's body was matched to Joe. Knowing there was no denying it at this point, Joe confessed and said it was revenge against society again for sending him back to jail for a probation violation. A nationwide review of unsolved missing child cases by the FBI found him to be a possible suspect in numerous other cases that occurred while he was on parole and after he had been released from prison, though there was not enough evidence to charge him with those too. Joe was eventually convicted on various charges, including three counts of first-degree murder, three counts of first-degree kidnapping, and aggravated S.A. 
He was sentenced to death and imprisoned on federal death row at the United States Penitentiary in Indiana. While here, he started another blog to document what life was like for him on death row, which was active from April 2010 to January 2021. I'll do a follow-up video on that if anyone's interested, as that's a whole saga in itself. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see that. After nearly a two-decade hiatus, the federal government announced they'd be resuming executions in July 2019, so death was finally coming for Joe, but not in the way that he had expected. He was diagnosed with glioblastoma, a cancer of the brain, and after undergoing brain surgery, he declined any other treatment, including chemotherapy, giving him an estimated 6 to 12 months of life left. He died on the 28th of March 2021 at the age of 58. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments, plus any other topics you'd like me to cover in a future video. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my Kofi members and channel members whose names are on screen now. I really appreciate your support. Remember to check out Conundrum929 by clicking the link in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week in a new video.